So first up is Nemanja Bumpus, Associate Dean for Basic Research and our newly named Director of the Pharmacology Department here in the School of Medicine. Nemanja will talk about the basic biology that makes certain medicines less effective in African Americans. Thank you. Okay, um, so thanks everybody for coming and hanging out and listening to my talk. So we, um, in my lab, we're really interested in understanding how different people and different populations of people as well respond to medicines. So one thing that we're interested in is looking at genetics of drug response and genetics of drug processing. And we've been particularly interested in looking at how African Americans and other members of the African diaspora are um, differentially responding to certain medicines and kind of understanding the reasons for that um, from a biolog biological perspective. So we primarily focus in on a process called drug metabolism. And the reason we do this, because this is actually the process that really controls the response we get in many ways to a majority of drugs. So basically for oral medications, most medicines we use are, or are orally administered. And for oral, oral medications tend to be lipophilic or fat soluble um, so that our bodies can absorb them. And then we need a way to get rid of them. Our body basically looks at them as a foreign molecule. We don't want these drugs to hang around forever. So we have this process called drug metabolism that changes this fat soluble drug into something more water soluble that can be excreted from our body. So primarily excreted in urine. So this process of metabolism happens in the intestine, it happens all over the body, but in the intestine and the liver, the liver is really a site where we have an abundance of the proteins that carry out drug metabolism. It's a protein driven process. And so since drugs have to buy, pass through this system, they're absorbed by our um, intestine, they go through the portal vein to our liver, oral administered drugs must pass through our liver where metabolism occurs. That means that metabolism is really controlling how much of the drug we swallowed ends up in our bloodstream. So when the proteins act on the drug, they form other products we call drug metabolites, and those can circulate in our blood and go into our urine as well. But essentially this process really controls how much drug makes it to your bloodstream after you swallow a medication. There are many, many, many drug metabolizing proteins. The one that we'll talk about that's really responsible for most drug metabolism are called the cytochromes P450 or P450 or CYP for short. So I'll focus a little more in on how this works just at a high level here. So P450s are important because it turns out that about 80% of drugs on the market are cleared by p 450 So they're metabolized by P450s and that's the major pathway um, by which our body clears these drugs. So what happens is if we swallow a drug, it goes through, like we looked at a slide before, through you know, our stomach, it goes into our GI tract, it moves to the portal vein, into the liver. Then we have individual liver cells just blowing out to show what happens there. The individual liver cell, so here a hepatocyte, this liver cell, contains these drug metabolizing proteins. So here just showing the P450. There are also other kinds of drug metabolizing proteins too. But this drug, when it's metabolized by a P450, gets changed. And what P450s mostly do is insert an oxygen into the drug. When they insert that oxygen, that's enough to make that drug much more water soluble and it can be excreted. So drugs through blood flow, they come in through transport often or other mechanisms can undergo metabolism by P450s. We get what we call a metabolite, this drug now with this oxygen inserted, and then it can go back into our blood. And so what I'm showing here is we have a drug kind of at the end of this blood vessel um, that also has several metabolites. And the important thing to think about there is that many drugs are metabolized actually such that 99% of it or more is metabolized. So this drug that you swallow, it may turn out that after it goes through your liver, only 1% of less or less of what you swallow is actually what ends up in your blood. So P450s really control the drug response for many drugs. And it's important then to think about how they're acting on these drugs and understand that since much of what we end up taking actually turns out to be metabolites. So what does this look like in a drug? 
So just to kind of show you this. So here I'm showing you an HIV drug nevirapine. And I only wanted you to see in real life what this looks like on a structure. So I told you P450s insert an oxygen. So here we have an oxygen inserted on the drug. So metabolite, we see a different metabolite here, an oxygen inserted. The third metabolite, oxygen inserted. They all have different names, 3-hydroxy, 2-hydroxy, 12-hydroxy, because it's stuff where an oxygen's been inserted. But the big point here is that one drug, whether it's nevirapine or caffeine, for instance, that many of us um, are exposed to, can uh, be metabolized to many different metabolites. It doesn't have to be one. It can be many, many different metabolites. Also, I told you P450s, we can call them SIP, and that's what we call individual P450s, SIP. So here's one P450 called SIP2B6. They're just named basically based upon how they look, their structure, and the order in which we found them. But all this to say that we can have one drug that's metabolized to many metabolites and also can be metabolized by more than one P450. So these metabolites can go on and be excreted in urine. As I mentioned, they're more water soluble. They also can have toxicity. So the major drug-induced toxicity is liver toxicity. And that's 90% of the time because a toxic metabolite was formed most often by a P450. So for instance, with Tylenol toxicity, it happens because P450s metabolize Tylenol to something that's toxic. So it's really important to understand this process from many different um, kind of standpoints. So with that in mind, um, we're really interested in genetic variation in P450s because you can imagine if they really control how much of a drug ends up in your bloodstream circulating and therefore how much drug is able to do its thing pharmacologically and do what we need it to do therapeutically. If there are genetic differences between people in P450 activity, that could mean that we could all respond differently to drugs because they are being metabolized differently. So it turns out that P450s are highly genetically um, variant. Genetic variation has been found in most P450s. Um, these variants can change the efficacy of a drug or how well it can work therapeutically. It can also change whether or not you're likely to get a drug-induced toxicity. As I mentioned, Many metabolites are responsible for drug-induced toxicities because they're toxic themselves. So if there's variation between you and me in the formation of that toxic metabolite, one of us may be more likely to have an adverse reaction to the drug than someone else. So we're interested in genetics from kind of both of those perspectives. Interestingly, this variation seems to be really related to ethnicity and geographic region of ancestry so we've been interested in looking that, at that and specifically trying to understand genetic variation in African populations versus European populations um, within the context of the United States, but also um, globally. So I'm going to tell you one short story with a compound that we've, um, a drug that we've done this work with. So this is just a model. It's not the only drug that could be sensitive um, to differences between people and metabolism, but I just wanted to give you an example where we've seen this play out. So this drug is Mirabarock. Um, it's an FDA-approved drug for HIV treatment. It is also a candidate for HIV prevention, so preventing someone from becoming infected, they could take this drug to prevent infection, and that's because Mirabarock is an HIV entry inhibitor. So in host cells, so in um, you know a human cell, there is a receptor or a protein that HIV binds to. And so Mirabarock blocks that interaction. It blocks the ability of HIV to be able to bind to the human protein, to the human receptor that it utilizes to get inside of human cells. So it's an entry inhibitor. So we wanted to determine there are differences observed in people between out and outcomes of this drug. It's often, as a result, used as kind of salvage therapy for people. I'm using people that have failed other regimens and kind of, you know, they need something else to move on to. So because of some of the variability in outcomes, we became interested in understanding, was there a genetic mechanism at play? So to first do that, we wanted to figure out which P450s metabolize Mirabarock. So this is just a summary. So the only take home here is that in humans, we have 57 P450s. There are, you know, a small subset shown here that are really involved in drug metabolism. The other ones do lots of other things in the body. We, in the lab, at the bench, in test tubes with purified proteins, 
tested whether each of these P450s could metabolize Maramara. We did that because we wanted to then be able to, in humans, look for potential genetic differences in one of these P450s that could impact outcome. We were really interested to find that the majority of Maramara metabolism was carried out by a P450 called 3A5. This was interesting to us because this 3A5, this other P450 that has the next biggest slice of the pie, 3A4, are very similar. They're over 90% similar. So it's actually very rare to see drugs that are primarily metabolized by one more than the other. But because they're so similar, people often don't even look to see if there are any differences there. Another reason why it's important to think about 3A5 primarily metabolizing Maravarock and why it was so striking to us is because it's a very, very, very highly polymorphic enzyme. So it turns out that what we consider the wild type or the most active, people that really have functional active 3A5 activity, so they can functionally metabolize things that 3A5 metabolizes. But that's mostly actually associated with people of African descent. So many African populations, like if you look at um, Bantus and Uganda and other folks, about 95 to 99% of those individuals have 3A5 and it functions well. Over 60% of African Americans have 3A5 and it functions well. You see the opposite when you look at people of European ancestry. So over 90% of people of European descent, including European Americans, have instead a mutated version of 3A5 that leads to low or no expression. This is interesting to us because there's a real lack of diversity in clinical studies. So most drug development clinical trials are done in European American males in their 20s in the US. So that means that if a drug is metabolized by this 3A5 and 90% of those people in that trial don't even have it, we could be looking at safety and choosing a dose based on people that don't even really metabolize this drug. You could see a totally different story then when you try the drug in African Americans. So we think it's important to really start looking for this, but also we wanted this proof of concept to see whether we could see any differences in Maravarock metabolism. So we designed a small study. We used 24 um, healthy volunteers, so 24 people that were HIV negative, that weren't taking this drug. They took it just um, to volunteer for our study. We had people in various groups, people that had 3A5, so those were basically African-American people, people that had both 3A5 and these variants where they don't have it, so that was kind of a mix. There were some African-Americans in that group, a couple of European-Americans, and then people that had only the variants that lead to no expression, and that ended up being a group of European Americans. We gave them a single dose of Moravarock at the dose that you would get therapeutically, and we collected blood at various concentrations up to 32 hours, and we measured the concentrations of Moravarock in their blood. And what we were really interested to see was that it looks like genetics really does affect our exposure to Moravarock. So this is just showing us basically if we look at the amounts of Maravarock, we could detect at each of those concentrations and use that as a measure of, as of exposure. So if we plot a graph where on the x-axis we have um, time, the time we collected drug, blood to look at drug, and on the y-axis we have the amount of Maravarock we could find, we can look at the area under that curve we get as um, a way to think about our overall exposure to the drug. And so what we saw was that people that did not have 3A5, so said this would be European Americans, mostly people of European descent that didn't have 3A5, had a certain level of exposure that we see here. And that exposure was actually significantly greater than people that did have functional 3A5. Um, so people like me, I'm someone that I have functional 3A5, I'm wild type for it, so I would be in this group that says two underneath it, where we have much lower Maravarock because we're metabolizing it more quickly. When we modeled this, we actually found that people like me and many African Americans that metabolize Maravarock more quickly would probably need double the dose of other people, people that don't have 3A5, so many European Americans, we'd need double the dose to get the same therapeutic outcome. So that means that we're susceptible to treatment failure, viral resistance, all types of things. So this does not split you know, completely down the line of um, ethnicity or ancestry, but 
it's highly correlated with that and I think really suggests the need to think about genetics um, in the drug development process. So I just wanted to summarize kind of my key takeaway points. So one is that drug metabolism is really critical. We think of metabolism also, we think more about you know, weight loss and things like that, but actually metabolism of drugs is a critical pathway um, for clearance of majority of drugs. And that genetic variation in drug metabolism really controls drug outcomes. And this can be different between people and different between populate, different in populations. Um, African Americans in general are understudied. People of African descent in general under are in general are understudied from a biological perspective. Um, but genetics, African American genetics is severely understudied. And in addition, um, we really need to start thinking about diversifying clinical trials. So if, we're, if we continue to do clinical trials in people of European descent primarily, we are going to be missing um, toxicities, we're going to be missing drug outcome variation that could be very important. And I think this is particularly timely, and we're talking about drug development for something like COVID-19 that disproportionately is impacting African Americans. If we don't diversify our trials, we aren't going to actually know how the drug is going to work in us. So it's just something I think for us to all think about. And that's all I have. And um, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. Great, thank you very much. A um, couple questions. Uh, so John Davis asks, is there anything related to diet that might help explain why some medications also may not affect African Americans in the same way as Diet can certainly have an impact. Um, we don't fully understand, but we know that a lot of um, P450s, the expression can be cranked up by lots of things. So for instance, alcohol can really increase expression, um, which is why you're not supposed to take Tylenol and drink alcohol. You crank up um, Tylenol metabolism when you, take out, when you drink alcohol with it and you make more of the toxic metabolite. So certainly diet can have an impact and environment, yes. Um, Sav Miller asks, are there significant differences in pain medication metabolism between racial groups? Are there ways to take these differences into account when making plans for pain management? This is something that's not been studied enough, so we don't know. There are anecdotal observations that people make for pain meds and for many other classes of drugs, but it's just really understudied. So I think we need to design trials to really look at that. But I think that more than we recognize, there are probably drugs that we need to be altering and thinking about the impact on various populations and genetics specifically, not just you know race only, but individual genetics I think have to be considered. Okay, so Annie Green asks, what can medical institutions do to regain the trust of members of the African American community who may be justifiably hesitant to participate in medical research due to unethical practices by researchers in the past? Yeah, so I think that's something that we think about a lot when I'm doing my studies. I think one thing that helps is diversifying our workforce. Um, seeing more African-American scientists, more African-American physicians, I think helps to build that trust. Having more African-American people involved in the process. I think that with health inequity and health disparities, that if we don't address that diversity in trials, but also the lack of diversity in scientists and physicians, that we can't really combat health inequities, that part of it is really making sure that we are part of every step in the decision-making process and that we are represented. And I think that by us being involved more, there will be more trust built. Great. All right, well, thank you very much again.